Now, in permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction, you had a molecule. I told you that uh, the molecule is going to have an electronegative D yeah. difference. Which would result in a partial, slight positive, slight negative charges on the molecule, which is why one molecule would attract another molecule, negative side would attract positive. And I told you that the dipole depends on the shape of the molecule, and dipoles tend to get cancelled out as well. So if you have a particular shape, like a carbon dioxide yeah. molecule, uh, the force of attractions are going to get cancelled out like vectors. So, so we did examples. So the shape of the molecule was also relevant. And the strength of the dipole depended on the fact uh, of what, how much is the electronegativity difference. If the electronegativity difference is very large, then the dipole created would be very large as well, and vice versa, okay? Yeah. And, and then we started talking about hydrogen bonding, which I told you was, was just an extreme version of a permanent dipole. It was the same concept. So how did you get an extreme version of a permanent dipole? Because, because molecules with oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine, which are one of the most electronegative elements in the periodic table, if they are directly bonded to hydrogen, that results in the formation of a very polar, highly polar bond. And yeah. I also told you that the negative charge on fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen is also is, is greater. Why? Because of the lone pairs on them. Because these are small atoms. And the electrons are very concentrated. They have a very high charge density, which is why the attraction between the lone pairs and the positive hydrogens is also very strong. That it's almost a bond, which is why you start calling it a bond instead of an intermolecular force. Although it is an intermolecular force, but the word bond is used because the force of attraction is so strong. So is this clear, Amar? Yeah. yeah. And... We talked about hydrogen bonding in NH3 molecule, in the water molecules. Okay, so we talked about hydrogen bonding. So whenever you see, so I'm going to do a few more examples. So whenever you see uh, O or F or N bonded. So as an example, if you have CH3. Yeah. As a CH2 and OH. Now, whenever you see O and H bonded together, that results in the formation of a very polar bond. But the negative charge on the oxygen is going to be greater because of the lone pairs as well. So if you have water molecules, the water molecules are also going to have partial negative and partial positive charges, and they're going to attract each other. So that's... So these are your intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is significantly stronger compared to permanent dipoles. Significantly. Like if, if you look at these molecules over here in the diagram that you can see on the screen. Yeah. Now, hydrogen bonding, all of a sudden, if a molecule has hydrogen bonding, its melting and boiling points are going to be significantly stronger. Okay. Compared to permanent dipoles, okay? And I told you the reasons that the lone pair is very uh, concentrated. It has a high charge density, which is why the attraction is a lot stronger. So is hydrogen bonding clear? Yeah. Amal, is this clear? Yeah. I so said, now, there's certain properties that need to be discussed. Uh, for example, one of them is that uh, water expands when it freezes. Yeah. When it freezes. You, can, you must have noticed this, that whenever you see water yeah. uh, uh, freezing, it expands. So anyways, uh, yeah. and this this is, uh, especially in cold environment, it, uh, it leads to a lot of uh, pipes break in homes. Uh, yeah. Due to expanding water, okay. So in in a very cold environment, it's it's not uh, radiators, car radiators explode because of water freezing, and it expands very very strongly. So what's the reason why it, why does it expand? The reason is the reason basically is hydrogen bonding. What actually happens is that if you have liquid water, 
liquid yeah. water molecules are randomly arranged so let's say you have all these water molecules mm -hmm. and they're all in liquid state so so let's say these are your water molecules and they're all in liquid state the water is water obviously has hydrogen bonds it can it's, it's capable of forming hydrogen bonds there's going to be positive hydrogens uh, the lone pairs on oxygens are going to be negative right yeah as in now so these lone pairs are negative this h is positive and so on as in now the thing is now the thing is that in liquid state molecules are energetic which means for them intermolecular forces don't matter because they have so much energy that they can easily break them so they are energetic yeah they can easily overcome intermolecular forces so as an example uh, if uh the water molecule over here and uh, the h positive and the lone pair are getting attracted this intermolecular force can easily be broken because the molecules are energetic and they're constantly sliding around so this molecule might slide slip and slide and move somewhere else yeah okay amal do you get this point yeah uh, the next point is that if if these two are getting attracted and even then the molecule is energetic and it could move around and so one second it could let's say this molecule over here you can actually move so this molecule over here can move around and they can all slip and slide past each other okay uh but what happens if uh what happens when uh, when water freezes when it freezes they lose kinetic energy so when water freezes molecules eventually lose kinetic energy yeah and when they lose kinetic energy they lose the ability to overcome the intermolecular forces so they're randomly slipping and sliding past each other but up to a point it's going to come a point would come where if a hydrogen bond is being formed and the lone pairs are getting attracted to the uh like as as you can see over here if the lone pairs are getting attracted to the positive hydrogen over here then they would yeah. not be they would i mean they're not energetic anymore so they won't be able to move anywhere they'll get stuck i mean this molecule cannot slip and slide amal you get this point okay yeah and the same would pretty much apply to this other molecule so you can yeah. let me try and move this just one second so the same would pretty much apply to this other molecule its lone pairs are going to get uh, i mean they're going to get stuck with the with the h positive okay okay so a crystalline arrangement would start forming like every time there's going to be an h positive uh, an oxygen is going to be bonded to it so we here an oxygen lone pair and uh, there's going to be h positive and they would all be attracted to each other so now you're getting a crystalline arrangement so molecule lose kinetic energy and are not able to break the intermolecular forces okay so they're not capable of breaking the hydrogen bond and when they're not capable of breaking those hydrogen bonds uh, 
large gaps are created in the structure, in the crystalline structure. So you start getting these large ga gaps that are formed because the water molecule, this oxygen over here, is going to be attracted to this H positive and it won't be able to leave it. So that results in the formation of these large gaps that are always present in, in the structure. Amal, is this clear? Yeah. And this is the reason why water starts to expand when it starts to freeze. Okay, so is this clear? Yeah. So the next thing is the last one. What is the third force of attraction? The third intermolecular force. Um, there's a lot of London forces. Okay, so that's. I mean the also called the Van der Waals forces. Okay. Or you can call them the London dispersion forces. Or there's the uh, technical name, which is the temporary dipole induced, temporary or instantaneous dipole. Okay. Induced dipole forces. Now, temporary dipole induced dipole forces. Uh, remember this, these forces are always going to be present in every molecule. So the first thing is that they are always, always present yeah. in all molecules. The other thing about these forces is that uh, they are weak or, or very weak in small molecules. Mm -hmm. But they're significantly, uh, but significant in larger molecules. Okay. So they depend on size. And so, for example, you have a molecule of bromine, mm -hmm. and the two bromine molecules uh, are they polar or non-polar? Do they have dipoles, or do the dipoles cancel out in a bromine molecule? They can't. They cancel each other out, right? Yeah, they they're going to cancel each other out. So how do, how yeah. do the how do the two molecules attract each other? Like, there, are there any positive or negative charges? Yeah, the two. Yeah, because bromine will be because bromine will be a minus, so they repel each other. Yeah, but why would it be a minus, and why would this be positive? Because they they need to attract each other, so they can be in a molecule. To yeah, the better will repel other molecules. Okay, so so what's basically happening is that even though uh, theoretically speaking, both dipoles are going to get cancelled out, right? Yeah. Uh, but what's happening is these molecules are always bumping into other molecules, and the electrons, for a very tiny instant during a collision, they might get knocked to closer to one of the bromines. So that bromine would become partial negative, and the other one would become partial positive. So this is known as a temporary dipole. So for a very minute instant, due to a random collision, the electrons got knocked slightly closer to one of the bromines. And when that happens, this bromine is now negatively charged. So what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to repel the other neighboring bromines electrons further away. And this would become negative and this one would become slightly positive. You get this is known okay. as an induced dipole. So molecules constantly repel and attract each other's electrons. And the next yeah. instant, the whole thing would change. For example, 
this molecule bumps into another molecule and changes dipole. Like for this time, the electron get knocked to this closer to this bromine. So this bromine okay. is now partial negative. This one is partial positive. And if it's partial positive, it would instead of repelling the electrons, it's going to attract the neighboring bromine's electron. So this side would become negative, and this side would become positive. So is this clear? Temporary dipole induced dipole. Yeah. So positive and negative, they attract each other. So there's going to be a force of attraction in the middle between the two molecules. Okay. okay. I said now. Now the next thing is uh, there's going to be a force of attraction, and so so they're fluctuating dipoles, like molecules are constantly bumping into each other. So the electrons are constantly getting knocked to either side. They might get knocked to the left side. They might get knocked to the right side. Yeah. So there are constant partial negative, partial positive uh, charges developing on the molecule, which is resulting in the in the induction of dipoles on the neighboring molecule. Hence, uh, this force uh, is created, and it's always there. Whenever you have a molecule, the molecule is not in an isolated environment. It's always interacting with other molecules, so the fluctuation is always happening. Even yeah. even in water molecules. Okay, even in water molecules, the negative charge density or the negative charge on the lone pairs is not fixed. And the positive charge on the hydrogen, although this is a permanent dipole, which means that most of the time this would be negative and this one would be positive, right? Yeah. Like if, if it's completely isolated, this would always be negative, this would always be positive. But there would be some fluctuation happening. Uh, the molecules would be bumping into each other and that would result in the in this fluctuation and the result would be temporary dipole induced dipole forces or interaction and it depends on two things number one is depends on size if you have more electrons you get bigger molecule and how do you check the molecule size that's mr if, if a molecule is bigger in size then it's going to have more Van der Waals forces. And the reason it's going to have more Van der Waals forces is uh, because more electrons are going to get knocked to either side. So, for example, you have fluorine and another fluorine. Now, the total number of electrons in this entire molecule is 18 electrons. Yeah. So, if it if 18 electrons slightly go to one side or slightly go to the other side, that would result in the formation of a negative or a positive charge on the fluorine molecule. Right? Yeah. But compare this to, let's say, iodine molecule. An iodine molecule in total, I mean, let's say these are all the orbitals and all the shells put together. This is an iodine molecule. In total, it has a total of 106 electrons probably. So yeah. Just just ima imagine if 106 electrons for a very temporary instant get knocked to one, one of the iodine atoms, closer to one of the iodine atoms. That would result in a very large partial negative charge and a very large partial positive charge. Okay. Is, is this clear? Yeah. Although these are fluctuating dipoles, but the dipoles created when 106 electrons kind of fluctuate, that would be much bigger. Yeah. I said now, uh, the other thing about this is that uh, the other factor, a uh, bigger molecule has more Van der Waals forces. The other factor, second one is that, do you know what the second factor is? Um, no, I'm not sure. I said the second factor is the surface area. If you have more surface area, if the molecule has more surface area, then you're going to have more Van der Waals forces. Okay. So now this usually just applies to, mostly applies to organic chemistry. Uh, because bigger molecules having more surface area, they tend to interact with other molecules more. For example, if you have a, if you have a pentane molecule. Okay. Now it has a total of uh, five, high, uh, five carbon atoms.
right? So this here is your pentane molecule. So that C five and H uh, would be, I think, twelve. But the uh, but a similar molecule, an isomer of this molecule, could be this one. Right, so you have you have a total of. Uh, I say you have a total of. Yeah. So you have a total of three hydrogens, three hydrogens over here, three hydrogens over here, and three over here, right? Uh, which one do you think? I mean, this is also C five H twelve. Which one do you think has more surface area? Um, the first one. Thing is, so the first one, it's more spread out. I mean, the chain is much more stretched out. Yeah. Where the second one is more compact. Mm -hmm. You get the branch and it's more compact. So which one do you think would uh, collide with other molecules more? The first one. You get because of the shape. Like it's so stretched out that anything that's moving around would, would end up colliding with it. So it's going to have more collisions, more surface area. So you'll have more collisions, more temporary dipole induced dipole. So I'm going to just call it TDID, temporary dipole induced dipole, yeah. or simply Van der Waals forces. So because of these of this higher interaction, but this only applies to organic chemistry. Like if you have long stretched out molecules. Uh, then they're going to have more Van der Waals forces. So Van der Waals forces, remember, depends on size, and it depends on uh, on uh, number of electrons. Now, one diagram that we drew earlier was, TK, we did one diagram, and that was yeah, that was about HF molecule and HCl. And HPR and HI, right? So we did the melting point thing and uh, boiling point, I think. And we figured out that yeah. HI is a very high, HCL has a very low, HPR is more, and HI is also high. So this was kind of the graph of, uh, I said this was kind of the graph for boiling points. Yeah. Now we did discuss that HF had hydrogen bonds, right? But what about these three? Why do you think, uh, which one has the greater dipole? Um, Out of the three, HCL, HPR, HI. I'm not sure though. Like, what, what does the dipole depend on? Um, the bonding between the two atoms, the hydrogen and the like, other atom. The, the difference in electronegativity, right? Yeah. Like you have HCl, you have HPl, and you have HI. So which one is more polar? Um, like where does be, it... Yeah. Would it be iodine, the HI? Because it's like the lowest on the table and the electric, electronegativity increases as you go down. The electronegativity decreases as you go down. Oh, so it would be fluorine then, fluorine. Yeah, smaller atoms, remember, are more electronegative because they're, I mean, why is iodine not electronegative? Because uh, the nucleus of iodine, which is the one supposed to attract the electrons, is surrounded by electrons, surrounded by lots and lots of shells. Oh, yeah. Do you guess so? Uh, bigger atoms, they don't tend to attract electrons very strongly. Which is why iodine is kind of unreactive because its nucleus cannot really attract other atoms' electrons. I said so. So the thing is, uh, this has bigger dipoles. Yeah. The other one definitely has lesser dipoles. So explain to me why does HCl have a lower boiling point? I mean, it should have the, it should have the bigger boiling point, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Because HCL has more dipoles, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you think HCL has a lower boiling point compared to HI? Why does HI have a higher boiling point, even though it has lesser dipoles? Any idea? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it because that, um, is it about something to do with the subshells? Because no, maybe no, they're I'm, acting. No, I'm saying, when we were st studying Van der Waals forces, I told you that it's always present in all molecules. Yeah. Even if it already has a dipole, I told you about water molecule, right? I told you that even though water is, has a permanent dipole, even though oxygen is permanently negative, and hydrogen is permanently positive, but even then, due to collisions, there's going to be some fluctuation in the negative and positive charges. I mean, yeah. you get the point. Mm -hmm. So the thing over here is that even though HCl has more dipoles, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be there's going to be Van der Waals forces, right? Okay. Who's going to have more Van der Waals forces? Um, the iodine because it's a bigger molecule. See, so the thing is, it's bigger and it's going to have more Van der Waals forces. It, it's it, it overall has more electrons, and this one is kind of smaller, which is why it's going to have lesser Van der Waals forces. So the thing is that even though it is a, it has bigger dipoles, but there's less fluctuation happening. I mean, the number of electrons are fewer. So which yeah. is why the Van der Waals forces are weaker. Whereas in HI, even though it has a lesser dipole, the Van der Waals forces, because it's a bigger molecule, are much greater, which is why HI has more, a higher boiling point. Amal, is this clear? Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to get, uh, so remember this, Van der Waals forces are always, always present in molecules. So, okay. so, even if a molecule has lesser dipoles, it might actually have more Van der Waals forces. So, the net effect would be that it's going to have a higher boiling point. Is this clear? Yeah. I said, so let's, let's start doing some past paper questions. We're done with the... Uh, Intermolecular forces, just one second. Where's, uh, I think it was, let me just. And let's, let's try and do theory. This is subtopic, right? So we can. Previous. Why, where's the just one second? This one, I guess. So this is, so let's start with, with this one. Question number 10 over here. Uh, which It says, the question states, which, which molecule has the over, largest overall dipole? Who do you think has the largest overall dipole in this, in, in A, B, C, and D? Um, would it be, would it be A? Because I think that's like, the most spread out. The dipole, he's talking about dipole. Remember, carbon and hydrogen have pretty much the same electronegativity or similar. Oh, uh, then I think it's. I think it's B or C then because the oxygen, because I think it's. No, B, I think. Because oh, yeah. the oxygen. Is, See, right, it's going to be B. Because the yeah. oxygen is going to be very electronegative, so all the electrons would be on this side, and the rest of the side would be positive, right? Yeah. Why? Why can't it be C? Um. Is it because chlorine is negative as well, and oxygen is? 
I mean, Oxen, so both... Oxen and Chlorine are both in the corner, so they they they're almost equally electronegative. Yeah. So they would kind of cancel each other out. And why not D? Um, because there's because there's no really electronegativity in that. There's only the chlorine. It's not like oxygen or anything. No, but chlorine is electronegative, negative, right? Yeah, but it's pulling in opposite directions, so it cancels okay. it out. Okay, so this one over here also, they're going to cancel each other out. Uh, the next one, in a solution of ammonia, what combination? Uh, uh, need, this one is... Let me forget this one. And so, which compound has a boiling point which is influenced by hydrogen bonding? I'm going to write the... I'm going to write the formula for each one to get the structural formulas. The first okay. one is CH3 serial bond ONH. Does it have hydrogen bonds? Yeah. Why does it have hydrogen bonds? Because there's hydrogen um, in the, in the um, compound, so it has to be bonded with the hydrogen. The hydrogen bonding was, I mean, is, is this H positive or not? Yeah. Why is it positive? It's bonded to carbon, right? And I, yeah. told, I told you that carbon and hydrogen are pretty much the same electronegativity. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for hydrogen bonding to happen, the oxygen must be bonded directly to H. Or the fluorine must mm -hmm. be bonded directly to H, or N must be bonded directly, mm -hmm. directly to H. So the first yeah. one is not going to have hydrogen bonding. What about the second one, where you have CH3? Um, will it be having high, Will it be forming hydrogen bonds? There's no, like, I mean, again, the O is. No. Tiga, can you hear me properly? I don't really have any, like, speech. Assemble, what about the what, what about option C? Hello. Hello? Yeah. Oh yeah. Now I can hear you. Okay, what about option C? Will it have hydrogen bonds? Yeah, because it has um because it has hydrogens that aren't bonded to another carbon, so they're bonded to the oxygen. Okay, like one part. of them is bonded only, to the only, carbon, only, one of them is bonded only to Only this part, right? The yeah. And the H would be positive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to have hydrogen bonds. Uh, so that's yeah. the one that's going to have hydrogen bonds. Now, the next question says, hydrogen bonding can occur between a molecule of methyl and a molecule of liquid Y. What could be liquid Y? Now, methanol. Meth uh, I'm going to explain what methanol is. It's uh, this thing. Now, first thing, can methanol form hydrogen bonds? Like, look at the molecule over here. Yeah. Why can it form hydrogen bonds? What's the reason? Because it's bonded to the carbon, and then the carbon and the oxygen are quite similar. So it's bonded to that. But is there going to be... I mean, for hydrogen bonding to happen, O must be directly bonded to? Yeah. I mean, is O directly bonded to H? No, it's not. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the H over here is not going to be polar at all. I mean, it's not going to be partial positive, right? Yeah. Because it's not, it's bonded to carbon. So the thing is, but are there lone pairs available? Yeah. On oxygen. So there were two things about hydrogen bonding. One was that the O and H must be directly bonded. 
And the other thing was that loan pairs, the other condition that I said was that the loan pairs on O and and F they must be present. Okay. Right? Now the thing is uh, you have a water molecule. Mm -hmm. You have one thing. You have lone pairs on oxen. That's available. Right? These yeah. What's missing? The positive H, right? Yeah. So which of these molecules, A, B, C, and D, have that positive H? Mm. I mean, like the like the first one. Let's look at the first one. It's CH three, O and H. Is the H positive in this case? Yeah. yeah so it's going to be bonding. It has a hydrogen bond. I mean, so it's H positive, right? So this H yeah. would be attracted to the to the lone pairs. Mm -hmm. So methanol cannot form hydrogen bonds on its own because it doesn't have both things. I mean, there's a positive H missing in methanol, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a positive H missing, but the lone pairs are there. So if the other molecule has positive H, then it could form hydrogen bonds with that. Is this clear? Yeah. And so now the next one is, uh, they're saying that, uh, Chlorine is a greenish yellow gas. Chlorine is a gas. Bromine is a liquid. And iodine is a solid. So Cl2, Br2, and I2. This one is a liquid and Cl2 is a gas. Now the question is, why, why is there a difference in volatility? Volatility, volatility means uh, why are the boiling points uh, different? Like chlorine has a very low boiling point and iodine has a very high boiling point. What are, what intermolecular forces do they have? Um, wait, is it they have like a low um because of it because of the the volatile because of the shells because maybe first thing, what intermolecular force do they have? Do they have permanent dipoles or not? No. Yeah. I mean, a bromine molecule will not have permanent dipoles, right? Yeah, no. So what type of, uh, would they have hydrogen bonds? Can they form hydrogen bonds? No. Okay, that's gone. So what's the only one left? Then the, the electron. The last one, right? Yeah, the electron one. I mean, the, 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 Electrons can randomly fluctuate around, right? Because of yeah. that. So maybe, so you're going to have temporary dipole induced dipoles, right? I mean, there could be negative positive charges building up, but randomly and for, for a temporary instant. And yeah. so they have Van der Waals forces. All of them, they have Van der Waals forces. So why is iodine a solid? Why does it have stronger Van der Waals forces? I mean, it's only a solid because the Van der Waals forces are stronger in iodine. So why are the Van der Waals forces stronger in iodine? Yeah. What's what's the reason why it's stronger in iodine? Um, is it like because iodine is like less electronegative is less electronegative? Yeah, but it and doesn't. I mean, electronegativity over here doesn't matter because the dipole gets cancelled out anyways. Yeah, like what does what does Van der Waals forces like, depend on? It's because um, like, this iodine is like a bigger molecule, has more shells, so the van der Waals forces okay. like have more, they're stronger. So out of the three options, which one is the correct one? Number two. Number three, the number of electrons, yes, that's true. And I mean, two is also correct. Both of these are correct. Yeah. The first one is not correct because remember uh, volatility, boiling points, melting points, they depend on intermolecular forces. You're not breaking the bond. Like like you have a water molecule, you're evaporating it. You're not breaking the O and H bond. Mm -hmm. uh, now this question, we just did a similar question. Which one has the largest overall dipole? 
the would it be C? Uh, aren't the isn't the electronegativity almost similar? Oh yeah, true. Um, I guess it would be B then. Okay. And which ones have no dipole whatsoever, like no overall dipole? Um, A and D, okay, because the, the the chlorines cancel out the dipoles. Okay. And so, which ones uh, describe a trend found in the halogen group? Like you have Cl two, you have Br two, and I two. I said, let's let's um, focus. Would it be B because because the van der Waals forces increase when the molecule gets bigger, and as you go down the halogens, it gets bigger. Okay, so B is correct. Uh, what? Why is A wrong? What about bond length? What happens to bond length as you go down the group? Um, I mean, you have, you have bigger atoms, right? Yeah. So bigger atoms means that the bonds are going to be uh, much bigger as well. Yeah, so they, the bond length increases, not decreases. Yeah. What about the boiling point? What happens to the boiling point? Like the Van Waals force is increasing, so what, what would happen to the boiling points? That increases too. Okay. So let's do one more. The physical properties, uh, let's focus on this. Which type of intermolecular forces can exist between adjacent urea molecules? This is urea. Does it have hydrogen bonds? No. Why not? No, yeah. Because it's not bonded to like an oxygen. No, but you had three options. It's either oxygen bonded to hydrogen. Or, oh, wait, yeah, it's bonded to the nitrogen, actually. I don't see that. Okay. So it's going to form hydrogen bonds. Does it have a permanent dipole, permanent dipole force? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, because the oxygen is okay. going to be... So the middle yeah. part has a permanent dipole, right? Yeah. I mean, this is negative, this is positive. What about temporary dipole, induced dipole? I don't think so. The, the, that's also there because... I told you that Van der Waals forces, they're always present. Oh, okay. Like, even if the molecule has a permanent dipole, there's going to be some fluctuation going on. Okay. Like, for a very temporary instant, this positive side, the electrons might get knocked to any side. They might get knocked to this side, they might get knocked to this side, wherever they... So, for a very temporary instant, there's going to be a dipole created, which would be a temporary dipole. Okay. 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 Let's uh, Amal. Let's continue uh, tomorrow then. Okay. Okay. Then take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.